Hello, my name is Alex Isles and welcome back to Arbea Roman Fort in South Shields in the northeast of England. I'm standing inside the museum of the fort now and I'm going to take you some of the finds from the archaeological digs on this site that really tell us something about the fort and what it was like in Roman Britain. To start off with, we have a large collection of jet that was carved on site at the fort. And this jet was originally from Whitby and Robin Hood's Bay, uh, which is just slightly further the south down the coast of Britain. And this jet is from Whitby, which is in Yorkshire and Robin Hood's Bay as well. So you can see that this was carved here on this site and it's got wonderful religious significance as well because it was connected to the cult of both Mithras and also Christianity as well. And so it's likely that this may have been a sort of a symbol for the people wearing it to show a religious connection on the site of the fort. Underneath that as well, we can also see bone working. And obviously when you're eating animals, you're left with a waste product, which is their bones. And these were carved beautifully on site. So we can see that they did things from art where you've just in front of us here, got a cavalry soldier depicted on horseback right the way through to things like uh, spoons, dice, other things like that. And these would have been worn around by the soldiers in their daily life and carved when they were off duty. We also, over here, have one of the really special finds on the fort. And this is a ringmail shirt. Now, these are very uncommon to find such a large amount of mail, or what we also refer to as chain mail, in one place. And this is because at one point, our Bayer Roman fort was either attacked or a fire broke loose. And so part of the building where this was stored was actually um, set on fire and collapsed. As it collapsed, then this was covered by a wattle and daub wall, which covered it over and ensured that it was then kept in a near perfect state. And so we today can look at it and see this amazing male shirt and it can be analyzed so that we can now understand a bit more about the weapons and armor that the Roman soldiers wore. Moving on, we now have another hoard at discovered at Arbea, and this is actually a really special find as well. This here is a pattern welded sword. Now, if you've watched my videos on Bambra, I talk about the pattern welded swords discovered at Bambra Castle. And the best way to explain it is if you take iron bars and you heat them up and you twist them around each other, much like you would plait someone's hair. And that's the same sort of way you make a pattern welded sword. When it's polished, it would have an absolutely beautiful pattern in the center of the blade, and it was a very high status symbol. So obviously, this was probably a Roman officer's sword or something like that. When this Roman fort here was extended in AD 208, under the orders of the Roman Emperor Septimus Severus, as he was doing his campaigns against the northern tribes of Britain and what is now Scotland, they wanted to extend the fort and probably to captivate good luck from the local spirits or things like that, this sword was broken up and buried into the wall of the fort. And when it was buried into the wall of the fort, it was then discovered by archaeologists later on. And you can see here, you've got a wonderful symbol of an eagle between two standards. And then on the reverse side of the sword, there is also a depiction of the god Mars, which you can just see an outline of there if I hold the camera. And Mars was obviously the god of war, so you've got the Roman eagle side by side with the god of war in this beautiful sword, which would then have been broken up and buried in the wall of the fort to provide good luck. And we today might think of that as an amazing waste as this beautiful item has been destroyed and has been left just to be, um, well, hopefully for the Romans' perspective, never to be discovered to ensure that there would be good luck and good fortune. But it also shows how that sacrifice meant so much to the person doing it that they were willing to break up this sword so that this, this fort would be provided with good luck and good fortune by the spirits and the gods present at that time. Arbea was also a cavalry barracks, a cavalry fort, and so you can see here a lot of horse equipment. 
Now, a lot of this is made out of brass and bronze. And so when you have this brass and bronze, we today see it as a dark greenish color. But when the Roman soldiers wearing it, it would have been golden in color. And so when it's golden in color, you can imagine these guys riding through, let's say, a native British settlement with all of this bronze on them, linting like gold and rich golden yellow color. And it would have made them seem incredibly fancy. Alongside this as well, there's a number of theories from archaeologists who say that bronze had a very strong ritual significance as well, going right the way back to the Bronze Age, because you can see it being deposited in watery areas, whereas iron tools don't have the same sacrificial value to European cultures. So it might have been as well that this would have had an important ritual significance to the soldiers wearing it, where they would have this and not only showing themselves off in a great uh, and very gaudy manner, but also at the same time as well having maybe spiritual protection or also um, being able to say a status symbol as well alongside that. Over here you can see some of the animals and unsurprisingly we've got both a horse skull and a cow skull, a goat, a cat and some other animals as well that were discovered here on the site. Cattle were one of the main animals that were used for the feeding of Roman soldiers. Um, there would have been a great amount of cattle brought onto the site, slaughtered, and it would have kept the soldiers fed in their diets. Goat would have also made a part of it as well, and goat skin was used in the maintenance of tents and other leather goods. And then under that as well, the horses obviously were their main form of transportation. So you've got a mixture of different things within the fort itself when it comes to animals. Over here, here is one of the most numerous things you find on Roman forts, and these are tiles. Now you would need quite a lot of tiles just to maintain the fort, because obviously all of the buildings would have these tiles on the top of their roofs, so you'd have roof tiles, and they'd also be used in other locations as well. And they show quite a lot of interesting things, because they've often got graffiti written into them. So the person who made them might have written some graffiti, or in other locations you sometimes see a boot or an animal imprint in them as well. And uh, when we go to other forts, we see this quite a lot too. So for instance, child's footprint, cats, other animals like that, all imprinted into these clay tiles which would have been put onto the roofs of the buildings. And our bear is quite interesting because within the fort as well there was also a, a kiln found which was making a lot of these roof tiles and then was used to basically maybe possibly supply other forts along the line of Hadrian's Wall as well. So quite an interesting one right there. Over here we see a lot of the personal items that soldiers would have worn on their day-to-day -day basis and also items that have traditionally been seen as more female wear as well. So you can see you've got bangles, you've got beads, you've got necklaces, you've got a, a comb used for um, the production of wool and alongside this as well a lot of hairpins. Now, in the 1st and 2nd centuries, and possibly into the start of the 3rd century, we don't see many female items within forts. But by the late 3rd century, going into the 4th century, we see a lot more items associated with women and children. And it's theorised the soldiers, as they became more regional, more local, would start bringing their families within the fort, and they would start residing in the same barrack blocks as the soldiers. And we also see in the 4th century, and more in the later period, the reconstruction of many forts with what has been called a chalet-type building, which is where it's a standalone building rather than a long, a long barrack block. And these standalone buildings are presumed to be a family unit's house. Whether or not that's the case, or if it's just a change in architecture or style at the time, is still to be fully decided on, but many archaeologists argue that. Below this, though, you can see a lot more items which would be seen as the day-to-day -day items of many of the soldiers and the residents inside the fort. So obviously we've got an oil lamp, which would have provided light. We've got a candle holder. We've got a spoon, which could both be used for eating and also for ritual elements as well. Uh, you can notice the spike on the end of the spoon. That would actually have been used for taking out meat and larger vegetable chunks because um, that would have been used in their eating. So you'd have your spoon and your knife, which are two main implements. 
And then alongside this as well, we've got a lovely range of brooches, which would be used to fashion your cloak. Today, we're so used to wearing jackets and coats, but in the past, your cloak was not only your uh, bedding for many poorer people in society, but it was also your day-to-day -day wear to protect you from the elements and keep you warm. So we have a wonderful array of brooches right here, which show a variety of styles from more native British styles through to the more common styles seen in the empire during the third century as well, and some second century brooches over here too. Too. And it really, your brooch would have said a lot about you, which groups you associated with, and alongside that as well, um, the cultures that you um, wanted to show off. So more British styles would maybe be seen as a bit more exotic um, and also a bit more ostentatious. And you're saying, well, I'm a bit more native, whereas maybe going for a more Roman style brooch would have said, well, I'm more aligned towards the Roman world. In the top right hand corner of this case though is two uh, or three objects that I find absolutely fascinating. What you've got there is key rings. Now, when we think of key rings today, it's just a ring that you put your keys on, but in the past, it's quite literal. It's a ring that you wear on your finger and has a key on it, which would have opened a personal chest. And these key rings would have been worn by the soldiers on site so that they could then keep precious objects away from other people and store things up. So maybe you would put your salary in there, maybe you would put your precious objects or things like that, or right in the center, you can see a female figure, which is probably a deity. And so because of that, you'd maybe put your little own personal idols to the gods so that when you need to pray, you lift them out and you pray to them. Um, even though it's not the best example, many of you may have seen the film in Gladiator, where, uh, sorry, Gladiator, where Russell Crowe's character um, takes out his family uh, idols and he takes out his little idol of his wife and his son and he says little prayers to their spirits. So in a similar way, maybe the soldiers would have had ancestors who they would have kept inside this box, brought them out, said quick prayers to them and then put them back away again. We can also see larger latch keys, which would have been used to raise the locks of barrack blocks or um, personal rooms when you needed to lock them as well. So those would have been important for the day-to-day -day life of soldiers or here at our Bayer Roman Fort. I hope that this whistle-stop tour of some of the finds here at Arbea has been very interesting and you've learnt a little bit about the lives of the soldiers and the day-to-day -day lives here on the site and that maybe it sparked some interest. I definitely suggest looking at the Arbea website because they've got a lot more and also you can look at the Tyne and Weir Archive and Museums collection which shows many of these and explains how they were found, what period they were from and some additional context and I'll link that in the description below. Until next time though, please do subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And if you would like to further support me and my channel, what you could do is you could support me on Patreon where you'll be able to have an influence on the future content that I create. Thank you very much as always, stay safe and well, and I look forward to speaking to you in another episode shortly.